Welcome to Empty Mentor, where we fill our cups and share our wisdom together. I am your host, Jennifer Hicks, and I am a board certified music therapist and licensed educator with over 20 years of experience as a clinician, educator, supervisor, and mentor. You can learn more about me and our Empty Mentor podcast and membership group on my website at www.joyfulnoisesllc.com. You can click on the link at the bottom of the homepage to receive a free infographic and periodic updates, including previews of upcoming podcast guests and episodes. It is such an honor to welcome our guest mentor for this episode, Jennifer Pinson. Jennifer Pinson is the owner and founder of Dynamic Music Therapy, excuse me, Dynamic Music Services Incorporated. Thanks, Jen, um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. There she manages a team of music therapists, interns, and practicum students. Jennifer is knowledgeable about business topics, having completed the Streetwise MBA program through the SBA. Jennifer is also a published author a speaker and the owner of Career Driven Mom, which focuses on finding your harmony through career, parenting, and you. She also offers coaching for entrepreneurs, specifically in starting a business, financial growth, managing a team, and diversification. Welcome, Jen. Thank you so much for having me. It is truly an honor to be on your podcast and I'm just super excited to be here. So thank you so much. You are so welcome. Why don't we start by just giving you the opportunity to share with our listeners a little bit about your music therapy journey and the work that you do now. Sure. So you want me to start like even how I became a music therapist? Absolutely. I think especially some of the students always enjoy that. And I know some of our professionals too. It's fun to reminisce and go back to the beginning. I know. So first I was actually went to school for music education. So my freshman year in college back in 2003, it was a uh, music ed. And um, I started taking my first year in college, I took a psychology class and I absolutely loved it. It was like, I just found learning about the brain very fascinating. And so I picked up a psychology minor right away. Mm -hmm. And so um, as I started getting into um, the education part, I realized that I didn't feel like teaching was for me, but I had no idea anything else I wanted to do. So I started kind of dabbling on turning my psychology minor into a major and started taking more psychology classes. And I found myself becoming a major of um, music uh, education and psychology. And I was like, well, I'll just go back to school and become a school counselor after teaching for a little while. I can teach elementary music and it'll be fine. So um, the summer before my last semester before I was going to student teach, I took um, a psychology class and actually learned about music therapy and learned about art therapy and creative arts therapy. And I learned that Indiana State, where I was going to school, had a consortium program with St. Mary of the Woods, where I could be a student at ISU and take classes at St. Mary of the Woods. So um, I met Sharon Boyle. I love Sharon Boyle. If uh, you don't know her, um, shout out to Sharon. <laughs> And um, so I met with Sharon and um, decided to take the intro to music therapy class. And I think Sharon is somebody who can really speak to my growth as a human and mm. as a music therapist and somebody who I feel like I've really leaned into on learning a lot about. Um, and I really feel like I feel so grateful for Sharon and Tracy and everybody at St. Mary of the Woods because I learned so much going there, not just about music therapy, but so much about myself. And I had a lot of self-growth while I was there and just a lot of learning in general. But so I ended up um, not student teaching, um, but graduating with my music degree and then finished my psychology degree and music therapy degree at St. Mary of the Woods. So I have a very healthy and a very expensive collection of bachelor's degrees. <laughs> Um, they are, I don't recommend that, uh, for students going into college to get three bachelor degrees. Um, so, but I wouldn't change any of it for mm -hmm. uh, anything. And so I look back at some of my, my youth and some of my younger days and realize that, you know, I, I didn't have life figured out. And I, mm -hmm. you know, there were a lot of mistakes that I made and a lot of, uh, learning that happened during that time. And, um, I don't regret my journey in any way, shape or form. And um, I'm super grateful for, um, you know, Sharon and Tracy and St. Mary's Woods. So that's how I did my internship in uh, Southwest Wisconsin uh, at Orchard Manor, where Sharon actually used to work. And so I um, was with Nikki um, at the time, she was Nikki Bossenbrook, but now she's uh, Nikki Journey and uh, Lisa Swanson. And so they were amazing internship directors and I learned a lot from them. That so, is awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
So how did you get from there to Dynamic Music Services and the rock star music therapy business owner that you are now? Um, well, I worked for um, a couple waiver companies before, and so I worked for Johnny Fogarty, um, who is probably the best, most patient boss you could ever have had as a first boss. Um, and she is now actually probably, we kind of mentor mentee together. We're in a peer supervision group together um, when it comes to talking about like business ownership and stuff. And so how cool is that, that I get to be in a peer supervision group with my first boss. And so I worked for her in Bloomington, Indiana for a little bit um, before moving to Indianapolis. And I worked for a couple different companies here in Indianapolis before starting my own. And so um, so they, uh, they were big, just big waiver companies where I was a music therapist inside of that company. And, uh, and then it was kind of like, you know what, I can do this. I can be a supportive supervisor. One of the things that was hard for me and my jobs in Indianapolis was that I didn't have a lot of um, music therapists to lean on. Mm. And I felt like sometimes I got lost in the shuffle of working and I didn't like that. And so when I, when I started my business, I wanted it to be a place that a music therapist felt safe to go to a music therapist. They were working for somebody who understood their job and they had were working for someone who had done their job. And so that's something that's really important to me and my core value as a, as a music therapist is I don't ever want to stop doing their job. Mm. And so even if it's only just a little bit, I haven't been a full-time clinician in five years. Um, so I think the last time I had a full caseload was leading up to my pregnancy with, with Elizabeth, who will be six in May. And so I, you know, it's been I guess almost six years since I've had a full-time caseload. And so I've kind of gone back and forth where sometimes I, you know, do a little bit more field work when we have some turnover or we have clients that need to get seen, I'll lean into doing a little bit more clinical work, but mm -hmm. I, can't, I don't think I could ever go back to a full caseload. Um, and I don't think I want to. And so, mm -hmm. but, um, but I, I still maintain that I do the work and I want to be a music therapist and I want to be a business owner. So I want to be both. And as you talk about wanting to be both, and as you talk about your children and just seeing your face light up, I know how important they are to you. Tell yeah. us a little more about that harmony that you've created in your life and what has led you to be and, and develop this idea of a career driven mom. So, um, so let me just paint the picture a little bit for you. So I um, started my business in May of 2014 and I found out I was pregnant in September of 2014. So <laughs> I um, literally grew my business while starting my family. And so, um, you know, for me, um, you know, I talk a little bit about this in, in the, the book. I'm a co-author in a book and I talk a little bit about, um, you know, how it was for me, self-confidence and like self-esteem was always a big issue for me. And so, and I feel like that always led a lot of my decision-making process, which was not making good decisions for a really long time. And for me, um, one of the first things that I felt really confident and really proud of myself for was starting my business and being, mm. and, um, and it was one of the first times in my life that I ever felt really proud of myself. And it was one of the first times in my life that I really took ownership for something that I did and I wanted to be good at it. And I, there was no failing on it for me. It was, I was going to do this and I was going to do it well. And I was going to learn. And my cat is joining us today. I hope no one. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sorry, no, I'm kidding. But, uh, but anyways, so it was that that time that it was like this this business was mine, and mm. uh, it began to make me a better person. It began to make me a better individual. It made me want to learn more. It made me hungry for knowledge in ways I've never been hungry for knowledge before. Mm -hmm. So for me, this idea of courage of a mom came from this place of that my career made me a better person. My career made me a better mom. My career makes me a better person. And so it came from this place of leaning into my career for my own self growth, for my own self journey, mm -hmm. for my own self things. And so, you know, I've been thinking about career driven moms since the minute I became a parent. I can remember talking to um, my best friend, Morgan, who's also a music therapist back, you know, back when I first became a mom about this concept of career driven mom and how, how it, you know, changed me as a person and how like I could, I, I liked this. And so it wasn't until, you know, years going through this and stuff that I've really created, you know, what I feel like is the foundational part of career driven mom. And as I look into, you know, what I can do in that platform as a career driven mom. 
That is so phenomenal. And so you, as someone who has, has gotten to know you, um, and I'm grateful for that opportunity to have gotten to know you over the last few years. Um, I just really appreciate your awareness around that and your awareness of, of being intentional as a music therapy business owner and as a parent too. And that concept of harmony that you often share about has really resonated with me. Uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, for me, um, creating harmony. So harmony, um, as musicians, we know is the it's you know multiple voices, and so you can't create harmony alone. Mm -hmm. Even if it's your own voice and you're dubbing your own voice, there's still something that's happening, and like you're still using something to create harmony. Um, there's absolutely, unless there's you know something I don't know about, there's no way to create harmony alone. And so the idea of harmony is that we're not meant to go through life alone and we're not meant to do these things alone. So as I was like trying to figure out, you know, the, my life in terms of parenting and in terms of having this career that I was really passionate about and that I really wanted to dive deeper into and do more in. And as I, you know, started, you know, feeling all these, all the feelings, um, I shied away from the word balance, the word balance picturing this teeter-totter that had to stay straight the whole time. And I know teeter-totters move and stuff, but it always made me feel this like part of like angst along with it and that it was unachievable and that like mm -hmm. I would never find balance in my life. Um, and so I started trying to figure out ways of creating space around balance without the word. And so it's actually, it came about, the first part of it came about in a brainstorm actually with Morgan. And then I just kept got, kind of going with it. And as, as I have dived into Harmony more, I've had these conversations with Morgan too about what Harmony means for me and how it relates inside Career Driven Mom. And so, um, and that's kind of where I've leaned into a lot of conversations with you, but it's mm -hmm lean into our communities. It's meant to be. And so I've actually um, started kind of doing a rough draft, draft of a book about, um, you know, cr um, creating harmony and finding harmony. And I've got, you know, five, five um, concepts about um, creating harmony that I really want to continue to develop more, which is um, mindfulness, self-care. Um, oh, I'm going to, I got to remember all of them. I should have written them all down before I came, but mindfulness, self-care, um, Oh, uh, community. Uh, but uh, anyways, I can actually pull them up and then share them with you. But um, but so I, I sent her around these five these five concepts of um, of career driven uh, being finding harmony. But I really, for me, harmony is kind of that way of life of not of understanding that we can't, we can't do these things alone. We aren't meant to do them alone. And then as you and I have talked about it a lot more with harmony, we realize that it's not always harmonious. It's yeah. not always rainbows and butterflies. It's not always this pretty this pretty place, but it's this place that has dissonance. It's this mm -hmm. place that has this dissonance and that resolving. And, you know, as we talk about in culture, that toxic positivity or, you know, this need to always be happy or find yeah. happiness, it makes me come back to that harmony part too, that it's okay to live in the dissonance. It's okay mm -hmm. to have that dissonance. Dissonance is sometimes very beautiful. Yeah. You know? don't necessarily see that. And so I've really enjoyed my conversations with you to kind of develop this harmony even more. And then I was telling you before we popped on that I had a friend who was listening to the pot or listening to our Jen and Jen, who mentioned to me that he kind of felt like balance was survival and harmony was thriving. Mm -hmm. And it like, that was really profound to me too, that it's like, you know, this harmony place, like we do thrive when we lean into our supports. We do thrive when we are finding our community that then helps us grow. And so it's, I mean, for me, that was just really profound to think about too, in terms of what, what harmony really can be. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your mentorship in that area in my life. Um, it has helped me to lean into those moments of dissonance because it's something that I absolutely love in music. Um, and so when I experienced that in my own life, it's allowed me to find some of the beauty in those spaces. Um, and so I just really appreciate that. I know you've already mentioned a couple of the mentors in your life as well. Who would you like to give a shout out to today on this podcast as mentors in your life, Jen? Oh my gosh. Um, so first off, I know this might be kind of weird um, with uh, the fact that we're sitting and talking, but um, you have been a big mentor to me. 
<laughs> and so, and I know that you probably know that. And, um, you know, I just, I've been so thankful for um, my time of getting to know you and talking with you. And I feel like I am just, I'm always learning from you and I'm always just in awe on kind of who, who you are and what you bring to the table. Um, another person who, um, who I feel like has been somebody that, you know, I think of mentors in so many different layers. And so mm -hmm. someone else that I feel like has had a really profound impact on my life and a direct impact that's a music therapist is Rochelle uh, Norman, mm -hmm. Rochelle Morgan, I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. Rochelle Morgan. And so she, um, I feel like just even like a few years ago in my own life, um, that there were a lot of things that I could really relate to her. And I, I feel like she's somebody that I just really admire in terms of the contribution that she does into the music therapy world, but then her contribution that I see in some personal things as well. And mm -hmm. I feel like she's somebody who is very, um, very present, very still, very, um, just, I just really, really love seeing the growth that she has had. And so, um, and I feel like this has been a couple years for me of just really being able to kind of sit back and admire her and admire some of her changes and stuff. And so they, she's another one. I've already mentioned Sharon Boyle too. Like I, um, I had some struggles coming into music therapy and Sharon has been somebody who was really patient with me and like really was a great professor and somebody who like took the extra time to make sure I could, su I could succeed. And, you know, some, one of the things that I feel like for me, um, I'm somebody who I will work really hard. Um, I will, I will get the job done and I will do what I need to do. Um, and with her, um, she saw that in me and she saw that part of me and, you know, and she acknowledged that, you know, she knew I would do the work and she knew I would become what, she thought I could be. And um, that was something that like has stuck with me forever in my career that I feel like um, if it weren't for her, you know, I wonder if I would have been a successful music therapist because mm -hmm. of the fact that she was so patient with me and so helpful for the things that I needed to learn. And so, um, and then, you know, the big mentor is obviously, you know, my love for Brene Brown. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could meet her in person and I wish I could have that intimate mentoring relationship, but I do feel like I have learned probably more from Brene Brown um, in my life than I've probably learned from another human being. Um, just because I've read most of her books, I listen to her podcast, I lean into her work because it's so, it's so meaningful for me in my life. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. And you've talked about, and I know that part of the reason Brene Brown has been so powerful for you is just some of those changes that you've gone through in your life. Um, sure. And so what is one of the lessons that you've learned through those changes, through perceived failures and challenges? What is one of those lessons that has come out of some of, of those more challenging times in your life? So the first thing that popped to my mind is ownership of action. And mm. so where I feel like we live in a world where um, we want to focus outward and not inward. And I um, feel like that's probably been one of the biggest changes. And I feel like it has actually made me a better business owner too. Um, because one of the things that I feel like as a business owner that I think about when I go into evaluations is I think about how I've been as a supervisor as well. Have I been a good supervisor? Have I been a good um, boss? Have I provided them the opportunity to thrive? Have I given them the opportunity to be the best that they could be? Because if the answer to that is no, I haven't then I need to super, I need to go into that evaluation with a completely different approach than if my answer is yes. Mm -hmm. so, um, the more self-aware I have become, the yeah. better I become in everything I do. And, you know, so I think that's a big thing for me is taking that ownership of my own actions and realizing where I have fallen short and realizing where I have given what I could what I, what I felt like I could. And so I feel like that is, it has been a game changer for me. Um, and even in the way that I support my friends and even the way that I support yeah. other people has completely shifted and changed since I started really taking that ownership of my own thoughts, my own actions, my own feelings, um, and doing some of the work that I needed to do to get out of my own, own way to feel whole and to feel complete and to feel, um, like I could do those things. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and your self-awareness just continues to shine through. And I'm sure those listening can tell too, just how, how much you value 
that journey of self-awareness. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that's something that Jen and I have in common. And we actually have an extrovert's guide to COVID-19 with the hashtag extroverted gens that we've been doing for the past, um, by the time this comes out, it'll be almost a year that yeah. we'll have been meeting once, once a month on Facebook to have some of these conversations around self-awareness. And one of the things that we often do during those conversations and just in our relationship <laughs> when we're not being recorded too, is sharing books um, and sharing those podcasts and songs and music that have influenced our lives. And so I'll just invite you here to share some of the books and the music that have most influenced you. You've already mentioned Brene Brown. Yes. And so the book for her, um, I thought it was just me, um, was probably one of the most life-changing books I've ever read. And so um, she talks a lot about shame resilience and mm. like, the courage to be vulnerable in that book and um, authenticity a little bit too. And so, you know, one of the things that I learned is that, you know, through those years that I was stumbling through and those years that I was kind of going through the motions, but not really fully living, um, it's because I had so much shame um, mm. from things I had done in the past and things like uh, things from my childhood and shame is inevitable. We're all going to experience shame. And I, she, um, I was listening to one of her podcasts and she said, shame is an unwanted title, mm. an unwanted title. And it's like, you know, mm. so, you know, anything that we feel like we're in that us versus they, that we're part of the they, um, and we're not a part of the us, you know, so for me, some of my days are being a single mom, being divorced, um, you know, there's so many, so many things that we are, and those things can be very shame inducing if we're not nurturing mm. ourselves inside of those things. And so even, you know, for my childhood, some of the things that were shame inducing and some of the things that, you know, were really carrying with me. And so that was something that I really had never heard of. I'd never really thought about it. And she even talks about that in her book that we don't, as society, we don't talk about shame enough, mm -hmm. that we talk about guilt and we talk about like some of the surface things, but we don't talk about what it means to carry with us that time we were disciplined in school in front of all of our peers. And it was really embarrassing that time that, you know, that, you know, we were, we were raised in a lower income family. So we had, you know, something that made us feel different than everybody else. We, we don't talk about those things that make us feel different than everybody else. And so, you know, if you think about that too, from a diversity standpoint as well, yeah. you know, it, it's my, it's really mind blowing to kind of think about, you know, the levels of shame that people could feel or the levels of shame that people, you know, kind of need to, you know, to kind of work through in order to be able to kind of get to that wholeness and living. And so it's shame is, is inherent. It's going to mm -hmm. happen. And so we've got to acknowledge it and be able to kind of work through that. And so that for me, that book was probably, like I said, one of the best. And then um, I brought some of them with me because of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> How did I guess? <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> this is another one that like really changed my life too, in terms of the workplace. And mm -hmm. so it's called the five languages appreciation in the workplace. And so it goes through the five love languages by Gary Chapman. And so he co-authored this book with um, a, a business owner named Paul White. And it goes through talking about how we can give um, verbal affirmations, we could give um, things in the workplace, and if it's not the love languages, our employees or our team or who we are with um, speak, then it's kind of lost on them. And so it gives you like I, uh, ways of being able to tell um, somebody else's love language in the workplace and how to speak it more fluently. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or uh, appreciation language, we shouldn't necessarily say love languages in the workplace, but our language of appreciation. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I feel like as a business owner and as a leader, that was something that was like very changing for me. And uh, entree leadership is another one. Oh my gosh, Jen, I could like list off a hundred books. Like I want to say essentialism. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a lot. So. Oh, I love it. Well, and feel free because one of the things I'll put in the show notes is a list of books and music and things that you mention. And so feel free if you want to send me any others, I can put those as um, some extra bonus material in the show notes too. So I, yeah, I, Jen and I can talk about books for hours on end. <laughs> that could be a whole separate podcast. How about the music that's been influential for you, Jen? I feel like for me, um, music shifts so much um, in terms of my life. But the song that really comes back, I loved Jewel growing up. Mm. And so Jewel was always one of my favorite artists. And I feel like for me, when I get into my headspace, um, there is no song that I would rather go to than Foolish Games. Mm. Um, and I feel like that's something that was just something that 
really associated with my life during some of the pain, more painful parts of my life, um, through my divorce, through, um, you know, some of that. And that was a song that was always a go-to for me. Um, so like when I think about songs, um, you know, it shifts so much and my music shifts and I'm always wanting to learn more music and I'm always wanting to be introduced to other people's music and stuff too, that like, for me, music's just always changing, but that is like the one song that has like it's always a part of somewhere in my life. And it's the song that I feel like ex I can use to express myself when I'm feeling like trapped or I'm feeling like bon like almost like too vulnerable in a situation. Um, and then the other song that kind of comes to me and I love a lot of her other songs as well, Rachel Planton. Um, mm -hmm. She's got some great songs, um, but her song Fight Song. I know it's uh, sometimes I feel like it's overplayed and sometimes it's almost too, too much for me, but I really like that one and Roar by Katy Perry. And so those are kind of, um, I think my three go-to songs that I could listen to um, all the time. And then I love Sarah Bareilles. I have a theme that I really like chick music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So if you had a pick out of those or out of and maybe another song, a theme song for you, Jennifer, what would be your theme song? I think fight song is my, that Aurora. Like I, cause I feel like for me, I am a fighter and I feel like for me, I'm always wanting to push the boundaries and I'm always wanting to do more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's kind of the song that wants that too. And so it's kind of that song that wants that, that better thing. And, you know, I love my life. I love what I'm doing and I love the things that I'm doing, but I always have room for, for more. And I always have learn room for, to grow. Yeah. As we all do. <laughs> yeah. I know you mentioned one of those components of harmony for you is self-care. And so in the midst of the growth, in the midst of being a career driven mom and all that you've going on in your world, how do you care for yourself? What does that look like for you? So for me, I have felt like for, and this is for me specifically, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like my mindset is a huge part of self-care for me. Mm -hmm. and so um, sometimes I don't have the time to necessarily like take a bath every night or, you know, um, sit down and unwind and do whatever, you know, the reality for me is that sometimes in the evenings I have to work and because I work shorter days in the middle of the day because of, you know, my kid's schedule and things like that. And so my reality is that I have to kind of shift. So for me, mm -hmm. for self-care, um, it's been about gratitude. It's been taking those moments to be gracious in the moment when I'm not necessarily feeling gracious, you know? And so it's like, you know, um, Hey, I'm having a really bad day. Like I'll never forget the time that I was really upset with Coles. I was really upset with them. And I don't even remember why I was upset with them, but I stopped and I listed five things I was grateful for. And I completely shifted and I was no longer upset with Coles. And I was probably the nicest person that customer service person ever like talked to in that day. And had I not taken that five minutes, I could have ruined her day. I could have mm -hmm. ruined her day ruin everyone else's day. But instead I took that minute to just be like grateful for what was in that moment. And so I feel like for me, and that was actually one of my five um, things that I forgot was gratitude is one of my, in my, my mom, my big stuff. And so, cause gratitude has been something that has been so important to me in the last couple of years that sometimes it's just being grateful in the moment for what is happening, even when it's hard to feel grateful, um, has, is a big game changer for self-care. Um, but I do really enjoy taking that space. I try to get a massage at least once a month or every six weeks. And that's important for me. Um, and again, this is just me. Um, I try taking baths. Um, I try to be still and mindful. Um, I've been really guilty about being on my phone way too much, um, mm. social media, um, because, um, I'm an extrovert and the pandemic being alone a lot has been really challenging for me. And so I've noticed that behavior. And so I've been trying to be more mindful about deleting Facebook off my phone for periods of time and trying to um, move back from Facebook a little bit more um, from posting as much and also just not engaging quite as much because I notice what it does to me in the long-term effect. And although it can be fulfill a short-term need, it's not good for me in the long run. And so, um, but I feel like that's also something that I've been really mindful of is how can I still have that, um, that connection, you know, that through the pandemic I've been playing Jackbox online and I've been playing now Among Us and excuse me, I have quite the social life on Zoom. <laughs> For which I'm grateful. Uh, 
I get to share in that a little bit with you. Oh, Jen, you you have so much wisdom from your journey. Um, and there are some music therapy students listening who are just at the beginning stages of their own journeys. What advice would you like to give them today? Um, so the most practical advice I could give you is understand the difference between a contractor and an employee. <laughs> All the music therapy business owners listening just cheered. <laughs> so, uh, you know, great question. And I love it when I get asked it is, do I get a W-2 or do I get a 1099? <laughs> and, and so it's a great way of just asking, um, you know, for if they know the difference. And so, um, you know, really understanding what job you're going into, um, understanding what it means to be a contractor versus what it means to be an employee. Um, so when you start looking for jobs and you don't know, um, ask and ask if it's an employee position or a contracting position, and also make sure that you understand the wage difference between a contractor mm -hmm. versus an employee and understand the support difference and all of the, um, you know, what that can mean for your taxes and what that means for your lifestyle. So that's like the biggest practical advice I could give you. And then the second is like, just be okay to make mistakes. Like mm -hmm. it's during your internship and during your practicum, like that is your time. And if you don't feel safe in that environment, it might not be the best environment and know that like it's okay to change and it's okay to make changes and stuff and what you do, but making sure that you feel safe to make changes or make mistakes. Um, because I feel like there is no greater time. And if, uh, if you, um, I really feel like your first job is also sometimes almost an extension of your internship. Like you're yeah. still learning so much. And so really, if you're, um, you know, find that place that you can be vulnerable, find that place that you can be um, yourself and that you feel safe to make mistakes. Um, because that's where I think the greatest learning happens is when we make mistakes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We know that students get inundated with all sorts of information on social media, as well as in real life. Uh, and they're getting all sorts of advice what advice should they ignore? Mm. Oh, that one's a tough question. So I feel like sometimes some like maybe ignore some of the negativity and ignore some of the, um, you know, um, the some of the like toxic, you know, toxic positivity too. And so know that like, it's not always going to be rainbows and butterflies. There are things inside of music therapy that are going to be difficult. Uh, the mm -hmm. other day I was talking about, you know, aggression from a client and it's always difficult. And, you know, there's, there are people that work in um, populations that there are, um, there it, they work more frequently with aggressive clients and it might become easier over time, but it's still never easy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, understand that there will be hard times. There will be um, this. It's not going to be rainbows and butterflies all the time. So try to ignore that and be okay with the fact that sometimes it's hard yeah. and ignore, you know, try to ignore those things that don't accept that it's hard and, and be okay with that. And so find your mentor, find people mm -hmm. that you can lean into that can support you on those hard days. Yeah. And I would say that's important, not only for students, but I know I still need that. Um, and I've been in this profession a while. Uh, and that is so important because we're all going to have those challenges. We're all going to have difficult days and we need to have space to work through them. We need supervision sometimes. We need mentorship sometimes. We need a good therapist sometimes. Um, and having those resources inc is incredibly important. Are there any other words of wisdom from you or for some, from someone else that you would like to leave with the listeners today, Jen? Uh, well, I mean, I think just, you know, always, I feel like just always kind of doing the best that you can. And, um, you know, like Jen and I talk about, it's okay not to know everything. And, you know, it's okay to um, sit in discomfort. Yeah. And it's all right to, um, to not know everything. And, you know, I think that you are going to be given lots of opportunities to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more you learn, the more you grow, the better you'll do next time. And so I think that's a big thing that Jen and I have talked about throughout the pandemic. And that's a big thing that I feel like is the best life lesson I've ever learned in my life. Um, I don't know everything today. I'm, I'm still learning. I'm still growing. Um, and the more that we learn and the more that we grow, the better we do. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Jen. And whose voice in music therapy would you like to amplify today? Who should we be listening to as we learn and grow? You know, I, you know, I, the first person who popped in my mind was, um, we talked about her uh, yesterday was Natasha, mm -hmm. um, Natasha Thomas and her um, community, um, her, uh, community, not, um, oh, what am I looking for? Um, Black Creative Healing. 
or yeah, the back rate of healing, but where she talks about like the community support. Um, yeah. yep. the Cause I, I feel mm -hmm. like that's, that's something that's huge. And I feel like that's something that's really lacking right now too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, something that, um, that, you know, I, I feel like for me that I'm missing is that small talk that, mm -hmm. um, you see somebody you haven't seen in a while and you have that conversation. And I've tried to pull that in a little bit in my life by reaching out to like old friends and like being, um, doing like zoom meetings and things like that. But like, that's the big thing I miss from conference too, is yeah. like, you know, we have these hangout rooms, but it's still, it's different than just seeing that old colleague in the hallway or, you know, seeing somebody in an exhibit hall and things like that. And that's like the biggest thing I think I miss is that, that random connection, that random communication. And so I feel like too, you know, from like that community, that community stuff, that is huge. And I feel like trying to reach out to other music therapists and learning. Um, I think that for me is, is kind of the shout out. Yeah, we need those communities. Mm -hmm. And, and we've had to be more intentional with creating them during this time for sure. So one of the communities that you are intentionally creating is this career driven mom community. Would you like to give the listeners a little more information about what you're going to be offering through career driven mom? Yeah, so I've been trying to decide exactly the way that I want to go with um, career driven mom. And one of the things that I felt like on my first launch that I really missed is my business piece. Um, mm -hmm. If you know me, you know how much I love business. And as much as I was trying to keep it out of career driven mom, I can't because it's keeping a big part of me out of it. Yeah. And so when I first started to launch with career driven mom, I thought about the fact that, you know, I don't work necessarily always 40 hours a week and I don't have that eight to five kind of job. And so I acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of things about, you know, being a working parent that I don't, I don't necessarily you know, have. And so I feel like for career driven mom, what I want it to be is a place to be vulnerable. I wanted to place a place to have the real conversations about how hard parenting is, how hard, um, how hard it is to parent in a global pandemic, how difficult it is to parent while working full time and to do all these things and to take care of yourself and to, you know, cook and to do all these things. Like, come on, like, so, um, so I think the biggest thing that comes to mind with career driven mom is acknowledging the fact that in society too, so oftentimes women feel like we um, work as if we don't have children and we have to parent as if we don't work. Mm, yep. That's kind of the, the platform that I want to take on that is how do we, how do we work in a society that makes us feel that way? How do we, how do we feel whole in a society that makes us feel like that? And how do we find that balance, that harmony rather, that balance? How do we find that harmony between those three things? And so, um, you know, I feel like for me, I've been consciously mindful of how these three things impact each other and how important all of these three things are and how they coincide, or how they coincide with each other. And so I think of it like as, in a diagram. So, um, you know, you can expect to have real conversation. You can expect to see vulnerability and authenticity inside that group and expect to feel support in terms of where you are in your career parenting in and with yourself. Yeah, and that is so needed, I believe, for a lot of folks in our music therapy community as well as beyond too. And for our listeners, we will be including in the show notes the links for Dynamics Music Services Incorporated, Jen's business, as well as Career Driven Mom. Um, all of that will be in the show notes. Is there anything that you haven't gotten to share today, Jen, that you would like to share with the listeners? I don't think so. I mean, I feel like I've shared a lot of stuff with you guys. And so I appreciate everybody listening. Well, we appreciate you too, Jen, and your wisdom and your mentorship um, in music therapy and beyond. And we'll also include the link to your book too, because um, your reach and sharing your story and sharing your journey um, vulnerably and with great courage. Um, and as you continue to learn and grow, I know continues to inspire me too. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to our listeners as well for joining us today. If you haven't already done so, please make sure to subscribe to this Empty Mentor podcast so that you don't miss an episode. And if you want to dive deeper into some of these practices, you can also learn about and join our private membership group at joyfulnoisesllc.com backslash empty dash mentor. That's J-O-Y-F-U-L-N-O-I-S-E-S LLC.com backslash M-T dash M-E-N-T-O-R. All music therapy students and professionals are welcome and equity-based pricing is available. Subscribe to this free Empty Mentor podcast and join our membership group today. Empty Mentor, let's fill our cups and share our wisdom together.